Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're out at Duelist Den, and our subject for this video is going to be how Colts 1911 was developed and how it became the uh, U.S. Army service pistol. So, let's take a look at how it performs first. Well, Pancho Villa was feeling the heat from Black Jack Pershing chasing his tail. So he decided to dispatch Evil Roy up to Pennsylvania to depredate and terrorize Blymeyer's Hollow in the hopes that Pershing would detach some troops to chase him. But Black Jack knows that Evil Roy is my business. So he sent me a wire, said fire up your tin Lizzie, get out there and go to work. So I've got my trusty 1911. And we're going to see if we can uh, end Evil Roy's depredations. Well, I think that'll send Evil Roy packing. So as you might imagine, nobody woke up on January 1st, 1911, and said, I think I'm going to invent the next service pistol for the United States Army. No. Uh, obviously, it was a process. Even a genius like uh, John Browning doesn't just get up and all done, you know? So, so in order to understand how we ended up with the 1911 Colt semi-automatic 45 ACP pistol, we have to go back a ways. And uh, we'll be going back to the days when we were using double action revolvers. And the first double action revolver that the United States Army used uh, in 1892 was a 38 long Colt chambered gun. And the Army thought that was going to be just fine. And everything went fine until we were in the Philippine insurrection. And then things got unfine in a hurry. Well, what happened is we ran into the Moro tribesmen in the Philippines. And uh, the group that we were dealing with were called the Juramentados, which means oath takers. And these guys would wrap themselves tightly in bandages get a little bit high, and charge into the American lines. And those 38 Long Colts were not even slowing them up. And uh, though they would eventually die from their wounds, they would generally be able to hack the American soldiers to pieces long before they died themselves. So the Army decided that that just wasn't working. And they brought back in the venerable Colt Single Action Army, and they brought in the model 1878 Double Action and 45 Colt, and issued those to the troops, uh, because the 45s were considered to be a much better man stopper than the 38 Long Colt. So at that point, the Army decided it needed a new service pistol. They pretty much thought they wanted a 45, but they decided to conduct some tests. So in 1904, the Army commissioned the Thompson Lagarde tests. Okay, so these tests were conducted by Colonel John T. Thompson. He was an ordnance specialist who later invented the Thompson submachine gun, and by Major Louis Lagarde. And Lagarde was an Army surgeon, so he provided the medical knowledge. And uh, when we look at those today, I mean, they're almost laughable by scientific standards. Uh, and, and in fact, I'm kind of amazed that, because scientific standards were much higher, even in 1904. Uh, but they ran these tests in two parts. The first part, which was not stupid, was basically to interview everybody they could get their hands on who had been in an actual gunfight, you know, handgun fight, in the Spanish-American War, and to ask them what they were using and what the effects were. 
and then just statistically go through that and come up with some observations on that. Now even though that's anecdotal, uh, that's actually pretty useful information. The second part of the test, I honestly am not sure how useful it was. Uh, they went out to the uh, Chicago stockyards and basically they shot live cattle with a variety of pistols. And though on the face of it, the, you know, that's not a dumb thing to do because it's not like you can go shoot live people. Uh, but it's really a small sample. And cows are big animals, bigger than us. And they shot them with everything. They, they used a variety of uh, calibers and, and gun types. And they used everything from the 30 caliber Luger cartridge, uh, the 9 millimeter Parabellum, 38 Long Colt, 38 ACP, which is the predecessor to 38 Super. Um, not as powerful as the 38 Super, but I'll tell you what, that 38 ACP round, 38 Colt uh, auto pistol round, that thing cranked at about 1,200 feet per second, so we're not, we're not talking about baby stuff there. Uh, and they used Blunt and Hollow Point 45 Colt. And they even went up to 476 Ely, and they shot also with 455 Webley. So these poor cattle were getting hit with everything. And, and just about everything performed poorly if you're looking for a one-shot stop, uh, which is actually not that surprising. Um, one-shot stops, unless they're really solid you know, heart hits or head hits uh, are more psychological than than they are physical often. Uh, it's, it's rare to kill somebody instantly with a shot. And, and of course, the deer couldn't surrender, I mean the cows couldn't surrender, right? So they just had to shoot them until they went down. Uh, but in doing that, they decided on the basis of, uh, of cow shots and uh, the interviews, that the next service pistol for the military had to be at least 45 caliber. And from that point, the hunt was on. Now, the first official Army sidearm that was selected after the Thompson Lagarde tests was not a semi auto pistol. Uh, because at the time there was not a single semi-auto pistol that would have met the specifications that the Army was looking for. Uh, so instead it was another double-action revolver, and it was basically Colt's new service revolver that was brought in as the military model of 1909 uh, in 45 Colt caliber, though the ammunition was reworked a bit to work better with the star extractors, bigger rim, uh, but for all intents and purposes, a 45 Colt. And that was basically thought to be a stopgap uh, because the Army knew that they wanted to have a semi auto uh, pistol as their service weapon. And the Army's interest really went back to the previous century. In, in 1893, Hugo Borchert invented probably the first practical semi-automatic pistol. Uh, and it's, it's a funny looking beast to us today. Well, I'll tell you that. Uh, it was a toggle link action. And the army bought some and tested them. And <laughs> to a certain extent, they liked them. I mean, they liked, they liked the ability to fire quickly. Uh, they thought they were kind of heavy and unbalanced for cavalry use and had way too many parts. Uh, but they were intrigued. And kind of at that point is, is when they really got it in their heads that they were going to have a semi-auto pistol at some point. Uh, however, nothing that was available early in the century, uh, the Luger, um, the Mauser, you know, broom-handled Mauser, uh, the Borchert, 
There are a couple of others, Bergman. Uh, none of those were available in 45 caliber, first of all. And they all had some fleas that went with those dogs. Uh, generally quite complex guns. Uh, the best of the bunch, of course, was the Luger. And the Army was pretty seriously interested in that for a while. Not gonna lie, that was fun. <laughs> but it seemed like the Europeans had the field to themselves in, in terms of uh, semi-auto pistol development. But probably America's greatest firearms inventor, uh, John M. Browning, also had semi-auto pistols pretty firmly in his mind. And he was actively working on them. Uh, of course, he developed uh, a machine gun known as the Potato Digger, and he actually made his first semi-auto pistol based on that Potato Digger action, uh, which basically had a flapping piece that went up and down, you know, kicking, kicking empties out and, uh, and slamming, slamming fresh ones in on a pistol. Uh, obviously that thing never went into production because I think it would have been quite upsetting to shoot. <laughs> but Browning didn't give up and he put together a number of, of different action types. Uh, some recoil operated, um, some with like the, like the Mauser, you know, a bolt operated one with a, uh, a fixed magazine, though though his pro Browning's prototype had the magazine in the grip as we would have now, uh, but it kind of snaked down into the grip loaded from the top. Um, that one also never saw production. But the Model 1900 Colt pistol was the first really practical high-powered, shall we say. It was chambered for the uh, 38 automatic Colt pistol cartridge, right? which is, as I said, now the 38 Super. Exactly the same dimensionally. The difference is the 38 Super is loaded to much higher pressures, so they're not interchangeable. If you put uh, today's 38 Super into a model uh, 1900, you're probably going to damage that gun. But same cartridge, and as I said before, not too shabby. I mean, 1,200 feet per second, you know, the 125 grain bullet, it's, you really can't complain uh, about that. I mean, it's really in the 9 millimeter Luger uh, power factor. And it was an interesting gun because it was the first short recoil operated locked breech semi-automatic pistol. And when we look at it today, we can definitely see the uh, antecedents of the 1911 Colt. Now, unlike the Borchardt or the, uh, the Luger, the Colt had a full-length slide uh, running along the frame. Uh, other guns up to that point had exposed barrels and had their action parts kind of behind the breech. Uh, but in this case, the slide held the bolt. It was the bolt. Uh, and that was innovative, as, as was the, uh, the locking lug design of the barrels. Well, even though it looks rather similar to a, uh, a Model 1911, the differences between a 1911 and the Model uh, 1900 are really immense. Uh, for one thing, the frame ran the full length of the slide, uh, which obviously does not do that on, on the 1911. 
the gun had two locking lugs uh, machined in the barrel and, and matching lugs in the slide. And it had two pivot links. Uh, one was at the muzzle and then one was back by the chamber, kind of where we're used to having it. So the barrel always stayed parallel. It didn't tilt the way a 1911 barrel tilts to unlock. And the 1911 barrel is retained to the slide with this pin that we're used to. Right, that pin right on the side. And of course, that is the pin that uh, goes through the pivot. Right? In today's gun, it's, it's quite robust and it holds everything together. Well, in the 1900, model 1900, the links, the pivoting links, were separately pinned. And the gun was held together in firing by a wedge. And that wedge ran in a machined slot in the slide. And then it had a matching slot, uh, I'm sorry, machine slot in the frame. And that wedge guided the slide. And it had rails, just like we have now on, on, on 1911. But that wedge traveled in that slot back and forth. And the only thing that kept that slide on the gun was that wedge. It would hit the forward stop you know, when the slide was back out to the end of the barrel. And when you fired, when the barrel unlocked, the recoil sent the slide back. Well, it would hit its stop at the back. And that's what stopped the slide and allowed the spring to strip a cartridge and bring it back in. That worked pretty well, except when it didn't. Because it would occasionally fail. Uh, and if it failed, you'd better hope it failed going forward because then you'd just be looking for your slide out in the field because if it failed coming back, <laughs> you, were, you were going to be digesting that slide uh, and that was going to be very unpleasant. So that was, that was definitely a weak point in, in that design that stuck around way longer than I would have thought it would. But, uh, and other obvious differences are the angle of the grips, things like that. But it still, it fed with a detachable box magazine, just the way we load them today, exactly the same. Uh, so there were a lot of pieces in place that were 1911-ish, but there were still some stuff that was outside the pale. Now, another really unusual feature of the early model 1900s was the safety. Because the safety was the rear sight, which pivoted up and down to block the hammer uh, and make the gun safe. That was very innovative, uh, but probably not very practical. So it did not survive even till the end of the production run. So the U.S. Navy ordered 250 of the Colt Model 1900s in 38 Orlo, and the uh, Army Ordnance Department actually ordered 500 of these. They ordered them in three batches, uh, 100, 200, and 200. And each batch had improvements made to it, like changing of the, the safety and uh, little things like that, the little positioning. They ran each batch of these things through some pretty extensive tests. And ultimately, the officers who tested the Model 1900, they liked the gun, but they recommended that it not be adopted. And the reasons that they wanted to reject it uh, was first, it was a 38, and the Army really wanted a 45. They were not going to settle for another 38 and go through what they had gone through before. Uh, second, the gun was, it was pretty muzzle heavy and it was difficult to manipulate one-handed. And the, uh, the testers had a number of accidental discharges. 
uh, because of the handling of the gun, basically. And they decided that that was a flaw in the design and that they were not interested in that. Uh, and ultimately it went by the wayside. But Colt was not daunted. Uh, they knew that they were on to something and they'd gotten enough positive feedback on the gun to know changes that they should be making. So they came up with another gun, the Model 1905, which if you look at it, it really looks very much the same. Uh, still has that wedge system, uh, but it was in 45 ACP, first gun in 45 ACP, and they felt at Colt that they had a winner here. Uh, and in fact, they released it for civilian sales immediately, and it did fairly well. And that actually allowed them to fund their development efforts on the gun. Uh, instead of just taking it out of hide, they were able to generate some, some revenue with it. Um, so, once again, they submitted the gun to the Army. Now, as it turned out, the Army was very interested in finding a 45 caliber automatic pistol. But they weren't interested in just being tied to Colt. Well, Evil Roy's partner in crime, Swingin' Sam, has showed up with his circle gang to take up where Evil Roy left off. So, just gonna have to take the old 1911, see if we can clean house. Well, imagine my chagrin when I miss that one. <laughs> Don't like that to happen. But, still and all, thanks to a trusty seven round magazine, we were able to clear out the entire circle gang. They won't be back soon. So, on the 31st of January, 1906, Brigadier General Crozier, who was the head of the Ordnance Board, sent a letter out to various firearms manufacturers and their representatives. And he invited them to submit 45 caliber revolvers or semi-automatic pistols for a new set of trials uh, to select the next Army service handgun. Now, General Crozier went out to 20 firms, but only eight of them ultimately submitted guns. And by the trial date of January 15, 1907, Colt had submitted both a semi-automatic, the 1905, uh, sometimes called the 1907 by this point, uh, automatic pistol, and they had submitted a double-action revolver, which was another new service. Uh, Savage, DWM, Bergman, and an independent firearms inventor, William B. Noble, all submitted pistols. Smith & Wesson submitted a revolver, and Webley & Scott submitted the Webley Fosbury automatic pistol, uh, which is maybe the strangest revolver ever made, and one that I would dearly love to shoot, uh, but they are incredibly expensive, as you can imagine. Uh, and you just don't find a lot of them around, particularly here in the States. But they are tremendously interesting guns that had no chance of winning this trial. But uh, just tremendously interesting. <laughs> the Ordnance Board decided that only the guns made by Colt, Savage, and DWM, uh, which was the Luger, were worthy of additional testing. Uh, and they thought that the Luger was actually too expensive to justify an order for 200 each of them for the tests. So basically, uh, with just a preliminary look at the few sample guns, they cleared the table down to the Colt and the Savage. Uh, 
Uh, and at the time, they were considered very evenly matched. Uh, and the Savage is a tremendous, tremendous gun. I've, I've seen the original trial gun, 45 ACP, uh, at the NRA Satellite Museum. Um, uh, it's, it's at the, uh, the Springfield, Missouri uh, Bass Pro headquarters. They have a, a satellite museum there that's phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to visit it, uh, it's quite interesting. And they have a lot on the 1907 trials there in that museum. But I've, I've seen that Savage, and it looks just like uh, the 1907 Savage in 32 ACP that I have, just bulkier. It's on steroids. So it's a fascinating gun. Okay, so both companies, pistols, Savage and the Colt, exhibited some significant problems during the trials of uh, 1907. So, the Ordnance Board sent Colton Savage home, said, here's what we're having trouble with on your guns. You work on them, make whatever changes you need to make, and we want you back here in November of 1910, and we're going to run the trials again. So, Colton Savage came back with updated versions of their pistols. Well, the Savage Model 1910 really didn't look much different from the Savage Model 1907. But in the Colt, we're seeing some major differences. So the Colt that was submitted in 1910 is now looking very much like the 1911 is going to look when everything is said and done. Uh, the frame no longer is the full length of the slide. It's held by a pin, a takedown pin, instead of a wedge. It's got an angled grip. The grip went from 90 degrees to 84 degrees for better pointability. And just overall, it's starting to look very much like the 1911 we all know and love. 6,000 rounds were fired during the test of 1910. The Savage broke 13 parts during the course of that test, 13 different parts. <laughs> and it had a lot of recoil. Uh, and part of that is because of the straight grip, you get more felt recoil out of that uh, because Savage had retained their straight grip. The Colt only broke four parts during the test but these breakages included two split barrels, that's not good, and two cracked frames, not good at all. Uh, so neither pistol was deemed suitable for adoption. So they said once again, go home, make these better, come back in 1911. So the companies went home, Worked on the guns a bit. Came back the next year. New trials and other 6,000 rounds were fired. Uh, the Savage, unfortunately, went from 13 breakdowns to 37 breakdowns during the 1911 tests. Uh, did not perform well at all. The Colt, on the other hand, went through the entire 6,000 rounds without a single failure. And the Army knew they had a winner. Now, Colt made a couple of changes, obviously, to their metallurgy. And they increased the angle of the grip again from, uh, from 84 degrees to 74 degrees. And we essentially had this gun in 1911. This is on April 21st, 1911, Colt received its first government contract for 1911 pistols, spare parts, arms chests, screwdrivers, you name it. And the whole bill was almost half a million dollars. It was $459,988.77. And that's when the dollar bought you a heck of a lot more than the dollar buys you now. 
So that was based on ordering 31,344 1911 pistols with two spare magazines for each, as well as spare parts and the accoutrements. So Colt's price for the U.S. government was $14.25 for each pistol uh, with one magazine. We learned some lessons. This is a gun, you know, this style of gun was used in World War I. Uh, and we learned some lessons from that. And those lessons led to the 1911 A1. It included shortening the trigger, adding cutouts to the frame behind the trigger, replacing the flat mainspring housing with an arched one, lengthening the grip safety spur, widening the front sight, shortening the hammer spur, and eliminating the double diamonds on the grips to make the checkering easier. So that, the 1911A1, actually became the version of the pistol that we carried into World War II and Korea and Vietnam. Uh, and it was, I would say, the most successful service pistol that the United States had because it stayed in service as the service pistol until uh, the Beretta M9 was introduced in 1986. So it had a very long run. And it hasn't gone anywhere. With modifications, uh, this gun is loaded, by the way, but with modifications, the same gun is still in use on the civilian side. Uh, in fact, this is mine that I, I carry in 38 Super. And the changes from the military model are really very minor. Uh, a few reliability things like a deep rejection port, better sights, things like that, but basically the same 1911 for all intents and purposes that we had in 1911 is still out there in the marketplace being very successful today. So John M. Browning, you've done a good job, but it was really the iterative testing through all the trials and taking the lessons learned and developing changes based on them, uh, that is what really made the difference and turned the Model 1900 uh, into the Model 1911, uh, which is quite a change. I mean, we're going from caterpillar to butterfly on that. And it's well into its second century of use on the civilian side and shows no signs of letting up. So uh, a tremendously successful piece of firearms history there. Well, no matter what else I might say about Evil Roy, he's no quitter. I can see him trying to sneak back into the hollow. So, time to put him back in his place again. Well, at least I hit him more than I missed him. <laughs> well, I wish I could give you my impressions of how uh, a World War I era 1911 shoots and feels, but I can't. I actually tried to source a World War I vintage 1911 for this video, uh, but I couldn't make it happen in time. And I was running out of time. Like I say, this is the last week in December. And I'm only in here by the grace of God. Because as most of the country got smacked with a tremendous snowstorm uh, exactly one week ago that still has the country buried, we got missed. And instead we had an ice storm, which was unpleasant while it was going on. 
But of course, when the sun comes out, the ice is gone, and I can still get in Duelist End. If we'd had a snowstorm, I'd not be able to get in here. And pretty soon, I probably won't be able to get in here, because even this morning, I couldn't get the lock on, on my gate out on the road open uh, until I took a bottle of, uh, bottle of my drinking water out of the truck and poured it over the lock to thaw it out, because the lock was frozen solid, could not get it to budge. Uh, and pretty soon we'll be under the snow and we won't be able to be here. So I had to get this done today. I couldn't wait for that 1911. So what I what I used was this gun, which is Taylor's uh, 1911, which they basically market, you know, for wild bunch shooting uh, and cowboy action shootings, wild bunch, which uses 1911s. Um, and it's part of their Taylor's tactical line. I've had this for quite a few years, actually. And it's a fine copy of uh, the actual gun from World War One. I. I mean, the only real noticeable difference is it has a, uh, a lowered ejection port for reliability. But it has a longer trigger. It has no, no cutouts on the side. It's, it's very much like the original 1911. <laughs> so my impressions of the 1911 is it is the bee's knees. I mean, when it comes to semi-auto pistols, and I know people often rag on me that, oh, you know, they've come a long way since 1911. No, they haven't. Uh, in fact, most of the pistols out there are based to some extent on design features of the 1911. But the gun just shoots, right? <laughs> it, I mean, it hits everything you point it at. If you do your part, it's going to do its part, and it hits like Thor's hammer with those big 230 grain slugs. So, you know, my impression on it is that the Army Ordnance Board done good when they picked the 1911. And there, there you have it. So, I hope you enjoyed this. I know a lot of you don't like to see me do modern stuff, uh, but this isn't that modern. Right over 100 years old. Um, so if you liked it, hit the like button, right? Get it, give it a thumbs up, and then we can goose around the algorithm. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. We got a lot of good stuff coming up. Uh, and even during the winter, we'll come up with some interesting things for you. So until next week, bye.